Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for us to begin the area-wide gospel meeting. We appreciate all of you coming out. We're in for a treat tonight to get to hear more gospel preaching and to sing these beautiful songs of the church. Tonight, we're going to be having speak to us Brother Joel Danley. He's the preacher for the Saudi Church of Christ. And Joel is going to be bringing us a lesson to develop our theme, What Do the Scriptures Say About the Home? You know, it's, there are three divinely authorized institutions. The home is the oldest. And then there is the government. Yes, divinely authorized, Romans 13, 1. And then, of course, the Church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. Joel's going to be talking to us about the home. There's probably a few things that are nearer and dearer to us than our home. And there are probably fewer things that are in more danger today than the home. So we look forward to Brother Danley's lesson tonight. It's great to have him here this evening. Also, Brother Art Greer from the North Hamilton Church of Christ is going to be directing us again in our song service. And we appreciate Art doing that. Austin just arrived. There was a wreck, and he's just here now to advance the songs on the projector. We appreciate him doing that. He's going to be quite an expert. <laughs> Thanks for doing that, Austin. And we've asked Brother Jerry Hendricks from the Lake Hills Church of Christ to direct our minds in opening prayer here in a few minutes. And at the conclusion of our lesson, we're privileged to have Jackson Eddie with us. Did I say that right? Eddie? Eddie. Eddie is good? Okay. He's a student at Freed Hardeman. He's here doing an internship this summer with an accounting firm. And he's staying with Steve Grubb, so we need to keep him in mind in our prayers. <laughs> and if you could slip him a little bail money before you leave, that'd probably help him out also. <laughs> I'm making it sound terrible, Steve. <laughs> If, if, don't worry, if Steve did not like those comments, he will let me know. <laughs> but we're glad to have Jackson here with us tonight. Thanks for being here this evening. Welcome, one and all. Thanks for being here. These services are being streamed live on YouTube, and also we're archiving the sermon for those who might like to view it later. We have about as many viewing on YouTube as here, so that's good. Let me mention just a couple of things, if I could, before Art comes and directs us in our song service. 
We have a literature table out in the lobby, as you saw, out in the hallway. And uh, most of the materials there are supplied by the World Video Bible School. And there are a number of these DVDs that are out there. Last night I was talking to one of the security guards as I was leaving. And he was talking about he believes most of the Bible, but there are parts of it he doesn't believe. And I said, you need to get a DVD that's on that table about how we got the Bible. And it might be insightful to you. So I said, just help yourself to it. You must have because they're all gone. He either, he either didn't agree with it and threw them away, or he maybe took, took a moment to watch them. But, but we want to thank John Warner and Rudy Kane and those folks at World Video Bible School for, for providing that material. Thanks so much. There's other material out there, like the North Hamilton Summer Series on Tuesday nights. That flyer is out there, and you want to get a copy of, of those lessons for you. I want you to be aware of that. Also, we placed these little brochures. This is Michael and Deborah Stock. They're missionaries to the Philippines, and we've known them for about 10 years or more. And uh, she's a Filipino, and they've been doing a great work. And he explains it all in this brochure that's recently printed. So we'd like you to get a copy of that to become more aware of their work. And then to be... Um, uh, painfully self-serving. Uh, there's some of these on the television program we do called The Everlasting Gospel. And it's got the time that it's on Sunday afternoon at 2.30, supported by the, the Browns Ferry Road Church of Christ. So anyway, some good reading material out there. If Joel's lesson lags or anything, just wander out of the hallway and pick up something to read. <laughs> no, I don't think you're going to lose anybody, Joel. I don't think that's going to happen at all. <laughs> <laughs> Save that for tomorrow night when I'm speaking. <laughs> Brother Art will come and direct us in song. Thanks for being here. We look forward to our hour together. Brother Art. Join with me, please, with our opening song, Oh, Think of the Home Over There. <clears throat> Good crowd in that. Good to see everyone here. prayer, dear Lord and Father of mankind.
As we approach our Heavenly Father in prayer, please remove all the cares of this world and pray with me as we approach our Father in Heaven. Holy Father in Heaven, we come before you thankful for all the wonderful blessings that come from your hand and we're especially thankful, Father, for this gospel meeting. We're thankful for this opportunity to come and hear the truth of thy word. Father, help us to revere it, honor it, and obey it. And may we share it with those round about us. Father, we're thankful for the wonderful gift of thy son, Jesus, for the hope that we have through him of eternal life. If we're found faithful to the truth that you have given us. Father, please open our minds and our hearts as we hear from your word tonight by Brother Joel. We pray that you would give him a recollection of the things that he's prepared and that our minds and hearts would be open to that truth. Father, please be with this meeting tonight and throughout the following days that, uh, that your word be spread. And much good in this area be done. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Our next song is a song that I did not know. A few days ago, Brother Joel and I were talking about the lesson tonight, and he mentioned this song, and it is an absolute perfect segue into his lesson. And I understand the Saudi folks here know this song. How many of the rest of you know it? Can I see a show of hands? Everybody know it? Well, a few people from East Ridge and so. Um, I usually, in something like this, I would like to always use songs that all of us know, because we're from different congregations and different things. But this is a song that just so perfectly fits in there, just cannot pass, could not pass it up. So if you don't know it, let's just kind of learn it. It's, uh, we're going to sing it slow, but um, just listen to the words and just see if, uh, see if Brother Joel mentions part of this during his lesson. God give us Christian home. God give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is taught and taught, homes where the master is filled and spot, homes round with plenty thy love and God. God give us Christian homes. God give us. 
invitation tonight would be the Lord, Lord, I'm coming home. Lord, I'm coming home. Good evening. Let me begin by saying thank you to the elders of the Browns Ferry Road congregation for having this event. I know it's been going on for several years now. We've not been able to attend uh, several years for several reasons, but appreciate so much they're doing this. I appreciate the McDade family so much, Gary and Sheila and Jason and Lauren and Austin and Jordan and for all the work that they do. I think uh, have to offer thanks to my folks who came here tonight. Uh, I don't appreciate Gary giving them a chance to go out in the hallway and roam around, but uh, they may take you up on that. Um, but that's all right. Not everyone is able to be here, but thankful for the ones who came. And it's certainly good to see a lot of smiling uh, faces from the Lake Hills congregation. Appreciate so much the years that we were able to spend there before we started with the Saudi church. And just a lot of folks that mean a lot to us, and we appreciate them so much. I don't know what you think of when you think of the word home. For some, it brings back great and happy memories. For others, it is a bit more complicated and hard to describe. And for others, it is downright painful, whether it be because of a death or abuse or some other traumatic event. It is understood that most often when we talk about the term home, we are not meaning the bricks and the beams, the plaster and the paint, the wood and the windows, but the people who are loved, the love that is shared, the space that we inhabit with our loved ones. We love to describe and talk about home. Home is where the heart is. Home, sweet home. As Dorothy would teach all of us to say, there's no place like home. Laura Ingalls Wilder is quoted in Little House on the Prairie as saying, home is the nicest word there is. Home, a place where all are welcome. Or even an Irish blessing that I kind of found coming across, came across through my studying the last few weeks. An Irish blessing that says, may your home always be too small to hold all of your friends. And then there are a few that are more along my speed. Home is where they have to let you in. We had a sign at our house that said family, but of course it means home. Our home is one tent away from a full-blown circus. Home, they say, is where your Wi-Fi connects automatically. And home is where you can say anything you want because nobody listens to you anyway. <laughs> there is no doubt that our homes give us many things. Our homes give us shelter. When we think about shelter, sometimes we need shelter emotionally or even mentally. But it certainly gives us shelter in the physical sense. My kids have often been in the van with my wife, driving when a storm overtakes them in the van, and they would give anything in that moment to be home rather than driving during that storm. Our homes are a gathering place. This should mean so much to us as the church. The building is more important, the building is in important, but the early church was meeting together outside of one located place. As we read about in Acts 2, 46, going from house to house, and even in Acts 12, 12, when they're meeting together in homes, in prayer. Our homes provide us rest. Most of us would agree, even as we'll all probably enjoy in just a little while. There's nothing like getting home and kicking your feet up and relaxing after being gone. Security, control. Identity, privacy, sanctuary, belonging. Almost everyone has a house, but fewer than that truly have a home. You've probably heard the phrase before, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And there's certainly some sarcasm and probably a little backhandedness mixed in that. But, but just maybe there is some truth. Underlying that there, while mama is not the central or the only person in the home, when our homes are functioning properly, when everything is in order, everyone has their role and is fulfilling said roles, when the home is as it should be, life is a little easier. So how should the home be? May I suggest to you tonight that the scriptures say, they tell us, Peter tells us that it is according to God's power that he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. James says that every good and perfect gift is from above. And that's from God. James chapter 1 and verse 17. And that should include our homes. 
He, that's God, established the home. We'll get there in just a moment. But he, but he established the home and He through His Word has told us how it should be. And so here is where I insert to this particular lesson my disclaimer of liability. Our home, our home, is not perfect. We do not have it all figured out. In fact, if you pass us on the road and if I were to see you and, and wave at you and smile, there's a high chance that I have brought my hand forward after having it backwards swinging at a child to try to get them to straighten up and not misbehave. I might bring it forward to you and wave. That would also be after we've threatened another child that they're not allowed to speak another word unless they want to be grounded until they're 34 years old. And then my precious wife has probably looked at me in that same van longingly with those eyes and said, please just take me away for a few days. Just a hypothetical situation though, just throwing that out there. I've said it before at Saudi. But the advice you are about to receive in no way reflects that we have a perfect home or the, the way that our, our home is typically run. And said statement absolves the opportunity for future litigation based upon such advice as will be given. All right, that's out of the way. All joking aside, I cannot explain how much peace that I feel knowing that it is not solely my advice or my knowledge that we are reliant upon for answers, but we have the perfect word of God. We have a father who loves us enough to give us his instructions, which is a great segue into the first thing that I'd like to point out tonight. Sometimes to understand what to do, it can be helpful to think about what not to do. To begin, let's point out a few things. When we think about our homes, we often become concerned with what the wrong things are saying. First of all, we sometimes become concerned with what the wrong people are saying. For years, wives, mothers, and many people have turned to the likes of Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Oz, Dr. Ruth, Dr. Phil, Phil Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael, and yes, I'm showing my age with those last two, or any other person who Hollywood will give a television show to. And here's the thing about people. It doesn't even really matter what the Supreme Court of the United States has to say. Now, we would like for them to rule correctly based upon God's will, but they, even they, are not the final authority on the home. We sometimes turn to books and to writers. Maybe you've been one of those spouses or parents who buy every book that you can find. Look, I've been there too. I've got a bookshelf of them home, at home full to prove it, of all these books. Willard Harley, His Needs, Her Needs, highly recommended. Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages, great for couples. Dr. John Gottman has an institute that bears his name that talks about uh, marriage and relationship research. James Dobson, surely you're not Southern or at least American if you don't own a copy of The Strong-Willed Child in your library. But I just keep coming back to the idea that you can stand at a bookstore in the self-help aisle or the family aisle and you can find hundreds of different, of idea, different ideas on how to love, parent, discipline and about anything else that you can think of. Maybe so many sources are not always the best. And then finally, I would say sometimes we unfortunately turn to our culture. Maybe the most dangerous of these three things that we've already talked about, because I think a lot of those television hosts and certainly those writers and authors are trying to give you something to use in your marriage and in your home. But maybe the most dangerous one of these three things is simply going along with the current temperature of the culture. People say divorce is just natural. It just happens. Homosexuality is okay. We should be fine with it. Children are sometimes confused. Let them choose their own gender. Two moms or two dads, it's not a big deal. Children should be allowed to make their own choices and live life as, as they decide. Which leads us tonight to our main thought. You're probably saying, well, thanks, preacher. You've clearly outlined where not to go. Do you happen to have any advice on where to turn? And I'm glad you asked. Our title suggests that we are going to turn to the scriptures, and we are. Four points to notice in this lesson will be yours. What do the scriptures say about the home? Number one, it is important. It is absolutely, without a doubt, 100% important. How do we know that? Well, Gary's already stepped on my first point here, but it's the first and the oldest institution established by God. We often say that there are three divine institutions, and certainly, in a sense, the church was in the mind of God for all of eternity. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. 
But as far as this earth go, goes, when we think back across mankind, we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, as far as this earth goes, the church is actually the youngest of these three institutions established on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The second God-ordained institution is government. Paul would write in Romans chapter 13 in verse number 1, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that are, exist are appointed by God. And as Gary sort of shrugged his shoulders there, yeah, we don't like that one sometimes, but it's there. A divinely ordained institution. Yes, the church. Yes, the government. Not only was Paul writing then in, in Romans, but we go back to Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1 and the reference to God using King Cyrus, King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and God's interactions with Pharaoh. God has ordained that man should obey government. But the oldest institution on earth began in Genesis 2 is the home. Isn't it interesting to consider, have you ever thought about it before, that yes... As we open our Bibles, light is needed. Yes, water is necessary. Yes, the plants help us breathe. But the next step in a functioning society is the home. It has always been communicated. We might think secondly, not only do we know it's important because it's the first institution established by God, but secondly, it's always been a part of God's plan for communication. And it's really also always been a part of His communication. I think about Hebrews chapter 1 in verse number 1. The Hebrew writer would say, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. We call it sometimes the patriarchal age, even before that, before the mosaical age, that God made His will known always to mankind. But yes, in the beginning, it was through the fathers. It was through the home. It's always been a part of God's communication. And we're going to get to the fact that fathers should still be a part of that communication. We'll get there in just a few moments. But not only that, I think about Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 12. After there are four commandments about God... The four commandments that begin about God and serving Him then comes next, honor your father and mother. Close, tied into our service to God is our service and obedience to our parents. The home is important because it's always been a part of God's plan for communication as well as a part of His communication. All throughout the Word of God, honoring your father and mother, instructions to parents, instructions to children. But then thirdly, we might say that it's also important to God that we, the Scriptures tell us that the home is important. We might say thirdly here because have you ever considered that the home being in order is a requirement for church leadership? You ever thought about that before? I know many of you know this requirement. It's found of elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 2. It's also mentioned in verse number 4. It's found in Titus chapter 1 and verse number 6. You go back to 1 Timothy and it's mentioned there for deacons. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 12. I know most of you are aware of this requirement, but have you ever considered its importance? In order to serve as a leader in God's church, you have to have your home life in order. Why is that? We cannot be effective in ministry and in leading the church if our home lives are chaotic. As we said from the outset, none of us are perfect. Preachers, elders, deacons, none of us are perfect in our home life at all times. But it is a requirement. It must be important that the home be in order. The home is important because it's mentioned there when it comes to church leadership. Number two, as we think about what the scriptures say about the home, we re recognize that it has an order. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. We would notice secondly here... The scriptures say that the home has an order. And I would suggest you don't got, go, have to go too far into Walmart or into your favorite restaurant to realize that sometimes that order is out of order in our homes today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. How many, we don't have time to enumerate tonight, but how many of our problems might be solved if we follow God's plan for the home in regards to that order. A husband is the head of the home leading 
and loving his family as Christ loved the church. The wife loving in submission. The children obeying their parents. And let me call your attention to Ephesians chapter 5 and 6. I know you're familiar with it. We always talk about Ephesians 5 when it comes to marriage. We always talk about Ephesians 6 when it comes to parenting and children. But think in your mind for just a moment about this epistle in particular being read before the congregation. What was taking place? Imagine the scroll, of course, coming to someone, a particular leader in the congregation standing up to read this letter from Paul among the people. The congregation called together in a setting such as this to listen. And can I suggest to you that there might have even been a high chance that the families are sitting together. Now, I love our young people at Saudi. Many of you have young folks. We love and appreciate the fact that they usually all sit together right up here on my right as I'm standing on the stage. They all sit together. It's beautiful to hear their voices. It's beautiful to see the large number together. But can I suggest that quite possibly, there, as they're reading this epistle, they're gathered together as homes, as families. And so what's read as, it goes through, as they go through this epistle? I know as you open up your Bible, there's a big number six, possibly, right there in the middle of the page. But imagine them reading this letter without numbers, without verses, so to speak. And the person reading it reads the words of Paul going from wives, of course it's verse 22 in our Bible, to husbands and without skipping a beat, going right to children. Because that is the divine order of the home that God has given Yes, we are all equal in a sense. I know children aren't exactly equal as we think about male and female husband and wife in a sense being equal, but we also all have a role to play. There is a divine order, but that order extends to how we influence the world around us. Think with me for just a moment about the influence that we have. Appreciate so much this gospel meeting and the opportunity to try to reach out into the world, into this community. Think about the influence that we have. Where does that come from? May I suggest to you that it begins, of course, first of all, in our heart, right? Each of us individually, it begins in our heart. But number two, then it sometimes extends to our marriage. From our marriage, it extends to our parenting. And from our parenting, it extends to our evangelism, to our influence. Now, now let's back up and talk about those for just a moment. And you can see the way that it goes together. It begins with each of us having a good and honest and faithful heart. If you are known as a good husband or wife, but you have a bad heart, then you're simply playing a dangerous game. You're putting on a show that one day will probably come back and bite you, as we say. But before we can be good spouses, we must have good hearts. Before we can be good parents, we must have a good marriage or be good spouses. And before we can share the gospel effectively, we need to be good parents. When we think about, again, as we said just a moment ago, if we want to be a good spouse, we have to have a good heart. In a similar way, some people claim to be good parents, but they have a terrible marriage. And here's the problem. The greatest gift you can give your kids is a happy, healthy, and stable marriage. So many problems come about because we are not following what the Scripture say, says in regards to the order of the home. Wives are not being submissive. But also, husbands are not leading as God would have them. When we think about what the scriptures say about the home, it is important because it's discussed so much in so many ways. But number two, we see the scriptures talk about the order that we are to follow. Number three, we see that the home is for training. What do the scriptures say about the home? The home is where training is supposed to take place. Having children is not a divine requirement. But when it occurs... There is now an eternal responsibility. If you have your Bibles, you might flip back to the Old Testament for a moment to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I know that's not the new law that we live under, but you are no doubt familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Shema or Shema there begins in verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's great, God. That's wonderful. What are we supposed to do with that? Beginning in verse 6, and these words, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. 
You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Teach, talk, binding, writing. It's supposed to be a part of our everyday lives. I know cell phones aren't mentioned in there or social media, but you get the idea, right? Everywhere that we go, all that we do, the Word of God, loving God with all that we have, with all that we are, is supposed to be a part of our lives. And again, then by extension, our children and our homes. The home should be the place where children learn all about life and the world. I know not everyone's cut out for homeschooling. I understand that. The shift from the way that teaching and schooling used to be done to, to pretty much everyone was public schooled or private school. There was no homeschooling. And now it seems to have kind of come back a little bit. More people are getting involved with that. I know not everybody's cut out for that. Not everybody can do that for various reasons. But that doesn't mean that there st still should not be training and teaching that is going on in the home. The home should be the place where children learn all about life and the world. Instead, in today's society, we have outsourced the teaching and training of our children to teachers and to schools, to hitting coaches and swing gurus, to their friends and their peers, and maybe worst of all, to social media and the internet. Oh, they learn something, even if it is the wrong thing, about love, about sex, about work, about relationships, about truth. They learn about those things one way or the other. And unfortunately, oftentimes as parents, we've set aside that duty of training and just outsourced it to everyone else that they come in contact with. And we see the fruits of that very often, when, whether you coach youth sports, whether you are involved in the school system, whether you have the youth group at church that you connect with in various ways or that you work with, we see what comes, what happens when we are allowed and allow our children to be taught everywhere else but by their father and their mother. Again, we've already talked about it a moment ago, but Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, the training and admonition of the Lord. What are the things they're supposed to be learning? They're supposed to be learning right and wrong. They're supposed to be learning how to be honest and how to live consistent lives. I heard Lonnie Jones say something several years ago at the Mountain Creek congregation that I wrote down and it's always stuck with me and I've always used it when talking about marriage or parenting in the home because maybe one of the greatest gifts we can ever give our children, of course, besides just becoming a Christian and that kind of thing, but when it comes to some of these other things, one of the greatest gifts we can give them is the idea of truth and consistency, honesty and consistency. Because what they see from the world and their friends and peers and teachers and other people is inconsistency. And they, they above anybody, children, can pick that out, can't they? Lonnie Jones said it this way in his counseling practices that he does, that he works with young people. He says, I can tell you within a 95% predictor of children who will have, will be uh, spiritually at risk because of their behavior. And here's the number one predictor of at-risk behavior in kids. The question is very simple, by the way. Do your parents profess things in public that they do not practice in private? Asking a child, interviewing a child, or counseling a child, and trying to figure out where their head is, what they're seeing, what they're thinking, what's going on in their lives. Simple question. Do your parents profess things in public that they do not practice in private? And Lonnie's answer is, again, within a 95% accuracy rate, he can tell that that young person is going to be involved in at-risk behavior and be spiritually at risk. Because they see that inconsistency in us. The home is to be a place for training, learning about right and wrong, how to be honest and consistent, how to be a keeper at home. For our ladies, how to be a provider at home for our young men. They learn about relationships, hopefully in particular about marriage. They learn about discipline, hopefully before the police or other authorities have to teach them about discipline. And ultimately, hopefully they learn about heaven and how to be faithful. The home is where they should learn these things from parents who love them. That's what the scriptures say. Are we really practicing that in our lives? The home is important. The home is a place of training. And we're going to notice fourth and finally here that the home should be built upon the proper foundation. 
I say should be because we're going to talk about it for a few moments. Sometimes as we look inwardly, we realize that's not the case. But the scriptures tell us that our homes should have the strongest foundation possible, and that is Jehovah God. Think about it for just a moment. When a house is built, and you know what I'm talking about, the difference. When a house is built, the considerations that go into that house, I don't know how many of you have built a house lately, but the considerations that go into that building process are usually numerous and strenuous, right? Perk test, soil test, water test, so on and so forth, all have to go in before you can begin to build a house. And yet more often than not, when a home is built, whether that be as a man and a woman joining together in marriage or a married couple considering to have children, there is little to no thought about the foundation on which that home will be built. More often than not, there is more conversation about paint and flooring than there is about faithfulness and holy living. There is more concern about the laws of the county or the laws of the land than the laws of God and His holy word. God is to be the foundation. In Psalm 127, the 127th Psalm, Psalm 127 in verses 1 and 2, the psalmist says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early or to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 7. The righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. We've already talked again about Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 9. In every facet, in every part of life, laying down, waking up, going about everything, our lives should be about serving God and studying his word. And of course there's Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27. Do you recall the story that is told there at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 7, 24 through 27. I hope you know it because I can get these kids to sing it to you, of course, if we had time. Whoever hears these words, these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on that rock. I know that here in context, Jesus is talking about spiritual foundation. He's talking about being obedient to the words of Christ. But may I suggest to you that I think we can make a little bit of application to the home in general. He's not talking just about the home. He's talking about us being faithful to God, serving Jesus and obeying His words. But we understand the concept of having a solid foundation. You know, there are many types of... Or styles of parenting. I don't know how many of you read parenting magazines or been in a psychology class lately. But there's all kinds of, of types of parenting that they talk about. There's, there's the free range parenting. There's the helicopter parenting. There's the lawnmower parenting. But may I suggest to you, we simply need more godly parenting in this world today. A Christian home is one where God is the center of everything. God gets to set the priorities, the agenda, the rules, the guidelines. A place where God is glorified and people are transformed. I appreciate Brother Art taking the time to, to learn and lead that song. I told him we could probably pull it off and sing it. But as he said, it's just a perfect lesson for us. God give us Christian homes where the Bible is taught, where the Master's will is sought. If we want to... Follow what the scriptures say in regards to the home. We have to be building upon that solid foundation, that foundation of God. And if I'm being honest, as we begin to conclude these thoughts, if I'm being honest, it is really hard, as many of you know, not to have a day like we did yesterday in our country in particular, where we see yet another national tragedy we have so many thoughts and emotions that run through our mind. And if I'm being honest, I think it's real easy for us as Christians to wring our hands, to shake our heads, to point fingers, to assign blame. But most of us would agree that we can talk about gun control. We can talk about mental health. We can talk about all those things if you want. But most of us agree that of all the trouble we have in this country, between the crime rate, between the mass shootings, teen pregnancy, mental health issues, abortion, divorce, and so on and so on, most of us would agree that the trouble we have begins in our homes because they're not according to what the scriptures say. I'm also afraid to kind of wrap these thoughts up that I think too often we fall into the Norman Rockwell painting idea of the home, right, as well. 
You see the picture of those old paintings or ads of the family sitting around the table. They're praying together. Then maybe later they'll retire by the fire and they'll have a devotional and the father will go on and on about some Bible lesson. They'll sing together. They'll have Bible time each night. They pray together. And, and let me just insert here. There are many, many people who choose, who simply choose to live the ungodly way of doing things. There are some people who just simply say, well, you know what? You can get divorced if you just fall out of love. That's okay. Or maybe they neglect their children because of just one night of passion. They say, oh, I didn't really want those kids. And so some people just simply choose the ungodly way of doing things. So because of that, there are many blended families or single parent families because of death even. Or the poor choices of others who are just parents, single parents, or maybe again, blended families. So we must acknowledge that sometimes it is due to things outside of our control. That our family might not look like a biological mother and father and two kids sitting around the table together. But the things that we just mentioned a moment ago, the praying together, the singing together, having dinner together, the Bible time. We do need to do those things that we just mentioned. We do need to try to have the moments of prayer and devotional. But we also realize that life is pretty busy. Life is sometimes messy. And in some ways it looks different for different families. May we strive to follow what the scriptures say about the home, about marriage, and about parenting. But as we stated just a few moments ago, the key to all of this is building a foundation upon God. Go back to what we said just a few moments ago that yes, we should have great families and great parenting. Yes, we should have great marriages. But it begins in our hearts. That's where it begins. So that's the key to all of this. The scriptures say many different things about the home. We don't have time tonight to get into all of it. You could probably spend a whole quarter of study on the home and on parenting and all, all of these things in particular. But you see, it's hard to have a home that is built on God unless your life is built upon God. We're thankful for this good congregation, for the opportunity to be here tonight. We're thankful for this moment that presents itself, that we can extend heaven's invitation. I think I heard Jason say last night, we're not sure if there's water on site here, but there's water nearby. Because that's how important it is. If there's someone here tonight who has not built their foundation upon God, we would be singing in just a moment to encourage you that you would become a child of God tonight. You see, you begin to build your life on God, then it does affect your work style and, and your interaction with your coworkers. It does affect your marriage. It does affect your parenting and your families. But it begins in our hearts. And tonight, if you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, we'd be singing to encourage you that you would like to be, if you'd like to be baptized for the remission of your sins, we would love to help you with that. If you'd like to know more, we'd study with you as soon as possible. As Gary said, a table full of materials out there that you can take and look at on your own as soon as you can. But interestingly enough, I actually heard a preacher just a couple of weeks ago somewhere that told me he had been a part of a situation where he'd been studying with an older gentleman in a nursing home, an assisted living kind of facility. Left with the man saying he'd think about it, got all the way home and got the call from the nursing home that said that man had passed away. And he didn't have the opportunity because he delayed just a little bit longer. All of us kind of were taken aback. You I mean, you know, we talk about it all that time, but it actually happened to you? I mean, it actually happened to somebody you were studying with? It can. And so as we sing about this song in just a moment and extend heaven's invitation, we encourage you to not delay. Build your foundation upon God beginning by becoming a Christian tonight. Maybe you're here and you are a child of God, but you realize that even though you began with that solid foundation, as we sometimes say, maybe you've wandered away from it. You've sort of turned your back on God. Maybe it's sin of a public nature. You'd like to make that known tonight. Maybe it's just the encouragement of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe it involves your home. Maybe it doesn't. We're just thankful for an opportunity to assemble here together and to sing a song of encouragement that you would be willing to become a Christian or come back to Him even now as we stand together and as we sing.
Do you have a closing song? Beyond the Sunset? Verses here, and then we'll have our closing prayer and closing comments. We'll sing this, and then Gary will have comments in our closing prayer. <clears throat> Join with me. Beyond the sunset, hopeless. Aren't you glad you were here tonight? Don't you appreciate your home more than ever after hearing Brother Joel? Thank you so much for such an outstanding lesson, Joel. So needed. One of the reasons we're in a public place like this is to know the public is welcome to hear the gospel of Christ and the teaching of the Bible. One of the reasons we're going out on YouTube is so maybe people will watch that. Everybody who sees this lesson tonight will definitely benefit from it. We owe it to Brother Daniel, Brother uh, Danley, for the lesson tonight, Joel's done a great job. We appreciate so much the effort he put into it. Before Brother Jackson comes and leads us in a word of closing prayer, just one housekeeping note. Some of you may not know that on Friday night, Barry Grider will not be here. He's in the Bible Lands. If you follow him on Facebook, you're seeing pictures of him at the Dead Sea, pictures at the Sea of the River Jordan. He's not sitting at the table showing us his food uh, or himself floating in the Dead Sea. But that's the kind of things he's doing. So he won't be able to get here Friday night. But Brother Alan Webster will be here. Alan is the editor of the House to House Heart to Heart paper. Hope you're familiar with that. And he's a good friend of mine and has been for many, many years. And we look so forward to hearing Alan Friday night. He's going to talk on the same topic about the second coming of Christ. So I want to make that note with you. We hope you can all come back tomorrow. Thanks for coming out tonight. Now Brother Jackson will come and dismiss us in a word of prayer. Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this wonderful opportunity for us as Christians to gather in your name. Even though we're not in a church building, we're in the public and just able to gather no matter where, no matter when, just and worship you. Just thank you for this lesson tonight. Let us be able to take something from it and think about it for ourselves and think about how we can do better at building a home centered around you, God. Because we, we're not perfect. Our homes will never be perfect because we're imperfect creatures. But you're perfect and we strive to be like you because you're so perfect, God. And let us strive to have the perfect home that will guide our children and guide each other towards you and let us be with us as we try to do that in our lives. And just thank you for that. Thank you for this week and this rain and the weather we're having, God. And just be with us in our lives. And thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
falls in my dang friend's email and then uh, with my golf watch and it falls in windows and I don't know. No, I made the mistake the other day of, check, of checking or clicking all inbox instead of just inbox. You know? So all that spam shows up. I'm like, man, I get a lot more spam. I'm not here everything. Uh, no, I, I forgot how many things I'm still part of. I've already, I've already did my whole <laughs> no, you are just facing the ball. My problem is that you're not going to play the same problem as that. I'm like, why is he not in the man? I'm sorry. 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 i I sent the email and I forgot to add the password, so. Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell her the question, and I knew that she was big for the time, and she was just through all this first time.
anyway, it's all good. We got plans after that, so she, where you might end up. Maybe around there. Okay. Oh, and Henderson, like everybody else, that's all I have about here. I mean, that's first Beth Ann's room, you see some of their kind of guys. I was to say, like, well, so it's this weird thing. Adam Cross, you know, Adam, uh, he works in Michigan. He works in Michigan. No, no, he works in the Belton fundraising now. He works in Michigan. But he's really the best thing, actually. It's like this weird thing where it's like, he's you know, a free hardware friend, and now he's like punching the bullet there. He's in the hall. It's like this weird crossover. And then Jerry, and like, shit. Yes, Jerry, when they lived out by Jack's Creek before they moved in the door, uh, he was like sharing property. His kids were playing with one of my, I mean, I'm like, this guy's really It's like when we were in high school, like, you know, that was the troublemaker. But like baseball, I don't know baseball, but he's a baseball team. And, uh, and so, um, anyway, it's just weird. I have this weird, like, Henderson. I, I was a townie, but then I was a free and now all, this, all these people are coaching their kids together. And so, uh, anyway, well, that's cool, man. So, I hope it works, it works out well for you. I hope you have a good summer and everything. So, uh, nice to nice to meet you. Uh, we, we live in Dubai, actually. Uh, you probably that far north, but we don't make it that far south. But where is that? So north, if you go, uh, I preach in Saudi, Saudi Daisy. Uh, if you, I don't know how far you've been, if you head out to East Sea, we live in Dunlap, north, and Saudi Daisy, so we don't have to come to like, uh, East Ridge. Yeah, we don't come to East Ridge, we don't come to the Edmonton place, we don't come to the house, we all the way. It's like almost 45 minutes an hour, you know, we go. We live in our anniversary, and she's saying, like, it's like, it's like, probably a bit more than five minutes from our house. We come to Hicks. So Hicks has got Target, Walmart, food and all that stuff. So we don't come to East Ridge, Food Wall very much, uh, kind of place. But uh, I'm telling you, hey, Bob Lake was just perfect. Uh, we went to graduation for my dad boy Buchanan for her cousin Grace. And, uh, and I saw Steve. He's like, hey, that's fun. We got to do that again. I was like, yeah, we should, Steve. That was a lot of fun. So, but that's, that's, I think that's also because he can beat me every time. So it's a little more fun for me. Uh, well, it worked out good. Between him and Brazier kind of pairing up and me and Blake and, uh, and Shrug and then me and it's the first time I ever met you. Ben. Ben, yeah. So, yeah. So we had a good time. Well, I gave you plugs Sunday morning after that. Uh, and, I, and I also carefully inserted that uh, I was at an event for GCCS, not playing golf. Because I, I didn't want to. <laughs> I had an idea. I really did. I was like, I said, so I was at an event the other day for GCCS. But the, I mean, we have the postcards. But I found that on the Facebook page or something. The heading on the Facebook page. So I just I took you and put it in my PowerPoint. Just said, I'll remind you guys, services are always there. And, and uh, you know, let us know. And somebody actually came and found me and said, where are those? And I told them where they were in the library. So, so at least one person may have got one. When y'all uh, find you can uh, let me know when there's some time to come over and talk a bit. I'll be glad. I'll figure it out. Uh, I, I figured out yesterday that besides being nervous about the issue of this together, I got to preach Sunday morning, but then we're doing fifth Sunday singings. And we're not doing North Hamilton. Unfortunately, but we're doing fifth Sunday thing. So, so, this, so that's this Sunday, and then after that, I'm on vacation for a Sunday. So I've had like one Sunday the next two weeks. Well, there you go. Great. It's great. Like, play golf, and, you know. <laughs> well, so my mother joke was Saturday we had to to work out, and we changed all of our mulch out to like rock, like river rock. And so I was like, it's a pretty rough week with the preacher. Like Monday, I'm playing golf, living my best preacher life, and by Saturday, I'm shoveling a rock out of the back of a trailer, you know, fixing the front of the church building. And I, I was never got to that money that worked out. With Six o'clock tonight. Uh, no, we do a one thirty service. Oh, so you're saying it's one thirty? Yeah, we do everything at one thirty. So well, I know. But I know. Think we're doing every. Is it Richard Sunday? Yeah. Who's speaking? Uh, Kevin. Okay. Yeah. Because he's coming back to Tennessee. I heard. Did you know that? He got the North Jackson job. Uh, I don't know if David Powell is still there or not, but uh, I don't know if he's still preaching. But I, mean, I know he's still been free hard, but, uh, but yeah, he's got North Hamilton. Which is funny because I saw that Cindy, he's North Hamilton, North Jackson, I saw that Cindy shared it on Facebook like two weeks ago. And then later on, back to find it, he was gone. And I looked at David Bard and I were texting each other, and he was like, Yeah, I was really fun that it's gone too. Well, then like the next day, Caleb shared it. And I'm like, maybe it wasn't actually, I mean, it was official, but maybe it wasn't supposed to be shared yet. Yeah, and so, but yeah, it, he and his family moved to North Jackson and he worked on that. So let me see Tennessee, Tennessee folks in there. So, yeah, be good. I know they, they appreciate that. Hannah's been worshiping with us. Uh, and she uh, And kind of settled there in Saudi. And so that's, that's been, been good. And, uh, 
I haven't heard there. So uh, I know that Lynn Singular really enjoy having kids, all the kids back, but not yeah, for anyone. Yeah, not, not so far away. Anyways, yeah. but, uh, good to see you, sir. Nice to meet you. Thanks for the plug. Yes, absolutely. Hey, I just want to say I was shorter than last night, I heard. Is what I heard. So, and I wasn't here, but I, I told David Farr texted me, and he said, he said, I want you to know Jason, I don't know if he came last night, he must have checked online like I did. But he said, I want you to know Jason went like an hour last night. He said, I expect you to go 90 minutes. And I said, my timekeeper told me that if you can't say it in 30 minutes, it's not going to be said. Right, you know? And, uh, but I told David, I said, no, no, I know you now. I've been monitoring the situation. And I know that the first two were more about 38 minutes. And so I tried to bring the average down. I think I was 33 or 34. Oh, good. We needed that. We needed you in here. Well, I don't make any promises. I don't know if I've ever heard Alan in person. I know who I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've never heard him in person. And then, uh, he's, oh, your dad more than I. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's got free running, I was going to say. No so, uh, he may go 15 minutes, he can go two hours. But I also have to say, I did, I mean, like either late last night or this morning, I, I checked it out, I swapped forward some, and I saw, I saw a picture of like 85 things on the screen. And I thought, well, if he went through all those stuff, I said, I'm not going to follow the screen last night. I said, well, if you go to Albert's Today was not the day for, for yeah. me. I, I really wanted to repent. Today was not the day. We had the worst trouble. We, 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 oh, I mean, it was home. It was, there was there was yelling and screaming. The wooden spoon was brought out the way here. And, Yes, we stopped at Target and she said, yeah. she handed it to me when she went Target and said, here, hold this while I'm in Target. Uh, I'm telling you, it was, and I, I, I carry one around. Yeah, that's why it's usually my bag when we go in somewhere. It's in her side of the van, so the passenger door of the van. And I'm telling you, I really didn't put that in your side of the van. I don't think you're a penis. I think we said it finally this afternoon. I was like, I'm talking about the home tonight. Y'all were making us something new. Y'all were talking about it. But I did. I looked at Joel and said, Honey, it ain't me and you. Thanks for a lack of telling them. It's for the lack of their listening.
Sure so you can have those young wood things in the wall, those wooden things that open yeah. for a char. Yeah. And it got colder and colder in here, didn't it? Uh, it was no. freezing. Yeah. I'm hungry. Yeah. As usual. That's what we're going to rename you, as usual. Yeah. I'm hungry, as 